The book is Crisis of Command, which just came out September 6th, uh, How We Lost Trust and Confidence in American Generals and Politicians. When you were calling out the leaders, you know, you know, specific leaders that you could have said, you know, that person had responsibility in this. Because there's a lot of people that you, during that time, it was, it's, it's Biden's fault. How can you just pull it in and come out and, you know, it's, it's president's fault. He's the commander in chief. He's the one that screwed up here. Well, no, it's the general's fault. The general should have given a better report. No, it is Biden's fault. No, it's the people in the, you know, who were actually there that didn't properly report. Or no, it's the prior administration. Everybody blames everybody, right? For, from your perspective, from your p- p- point of view as an 05 who was in it, who knows the climate, who knows how not to leave, who knows that others are talking about this regularly. Everybody knows we're eventually leaving Afghanistan. Yeah. Who does the buck stop with? You know, if you have to say this person first, then this person, then that person, who would those names be? Yeah, so I absolutely think President Biden made some bad decisions. But when I went through my ordeal, I never actually used the word president, used the word Biden. And every headline you read about me said Lieutenant Colonel Scheller criticizes President Biden's botched Afghanistan withdrawal. Never used President Biden's name, my wrath during my ordeal was on the military professionals. And so where we're losing wars right now, politicians are outlining objectives. So it's political objectives that we're using violence to try to compel an enemy to do something. And right now our general officers are not being held accountable to that. And there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, One of the biggest ones is they rotate out every two years and you can't accomplish the goals within the time frame of their little tours. And so it's like, well, if none of us are accountable, um, you know, if, if one of us can't see it from start to end, then no one's really accountable. And so my position was in April, and I can go through the list real quick. In April 1, 2021, President Biden ordered a withdrawal of military forces from Afghanistan. And the theater commander at the time was a guy named General McKenzie. My opinion is General McKenzie should have pushed back and, and and not allowed that to happen. Now, General McKenzie in his congressional testimony has said that he disagreed with the president's order, and he said as much through Secretary Austin, but the president said, no, this is what we're going to do. So there's a, a moral case study right there. So people often say, well, if you're the general, you have to follow the orders. Well, there's historical case studies. If you go back to Carter's presidency, there was a guy named Singlaub, S-I-N-G-L-A-U-B, and he was the commander of all forces in Korea. And it's like the same situation. Carter and Biden, a lot of similarities. And Carter said, I want you to pull all American forces out of Korea. And Singh Lob's like, if you do that, the Koreans will all go to war. That whole Korean war we had, it'll all be for naught. And Carter said, I heard you out, but this is what we're doing. And then Singh Lob went public with his disagreement with Carter, and he ultimately changed the course of those events, right? So we don't make generals like that anymore. So McKinsey could have done that. He chose not to, right? Secondly... We, not only are we evacuating military forces before we evacuate American citizens, no brainer, but we decide to do it from April to September. Anyone that served in Afghanistan knows the Taliban hides in the mountains in the winter. That's why we have what we call a spring fighting season. So we could have conducted the withdrawal from October to March and been completely uncontested, but we did it in the peak fighting season because the PR date of September 11th was more important than American lives and American treasures. So there's like two huge mistakes that I saw play out real time as I'm watching this. And then the third week, so this is information that I've got later, the military investigation that was presented to Biden, I think the guy, the reporter's name was like Lester Holt, Luke Holt, something like that. Lester Holt. Yeah. So he asked President Biden, hey, the military investigation, what do you think about it? And President Biden's like, I reject it. And so then he came back and he tried to ask like an intelligent follow-up question, like, what parts do you disagree with? And he just said again, I reject it. And that's the only thing we've gotten from the president on that investigation. Well, that investigation was sent to me by a a disgruntled staff officer. And in the investigation, it lays out that General McKenzie's planners, so when he was doing the withdrawal starting 1 April, he assigned a separate general officer to plan the evacuation. So in D.C., they're planning a be prepared to evacuation separate mission. Those planners planned on using Bagram all the way until the third week of June when unexpectedly then General McKenzie ordered them to pull Bagram off the the table. Bagram was the key piece of terrain that we needed. The planners, even when you read the investigation, don't understand why he made that decision. General McKenzie in his congressional testimony later said because 650 troops wasn't enough to hold the embassy and the H. Kaya airfield right next to the embassy. And so he decided to pull off Bagram. Well, so the next week we, we abandoned Bagram. 
A month later, 10 August, the Taliban walks in, finds 7,000 prisoners. I mean, that's more than we responded to in the entire Kabul disaster. And that's not even counting the Taliban force, right? So then those 7,000, all of the Taliban walk up to Kabul. Now it's 15 August. This is when General McKenzie realizes his plan is falling apart. He throws 5,000 troops in addition to the 650 at Kabul. So two Marine battalions in the 82nd. They clash with the Taliban. The Marines have confirmed now that they killed, you know, five to six at least Taliban fighters. That's never reported. Then that same day, General McKenzie orders them to stand post with the people they just killed, calls them a critical external partner. They obviously allow the suicide bomber to go through the checkpoint, probably came from the prison, kills the 13 service members, injures 20 more, kills hundreds of Afghan civilians in the gate. In response, we conduct a drone strike, kill nothing but women and children, and then we stand there and call it an overwhelming success. I mean, there is no better list of just poor decisions that were made. And so, yeah, the junior enlisted service member standing on the wall grabbing babies over barbed wire is doing everything he can. He's not thinking about politics, and I got all that. But no one is going back and saying, hey, the decisions that were made between the National Security Council and the four-star general put our service members in a terrible position. And there was plenty of off-ramps and preventable ways to do this better. Such as? Well, I mean, you could just go through it. Obviously, because, and, and the reason why I ask this is the following. Here's, here's what I ask. Let's just say all of a sudden, you know, in business, somebody's making a bad decision at the top, right? And it's a big business, yeah. not a small business. Afghanistan is not a small business. It's a big business, meaning we put a lot of money into it. We didn't put $10 million, $100 million, a billion dollars. We put real money into Afghanistan. Yeah. Some are saying a trillion. Some are saying $3 trillion. That's a lot of money that we put into this thing. Right? That's a big investment. So when something like that happens and people are fully vested, their lives, their friends have died, they've seen crisis, they've seen issues, you've witnessed stuff, that stuff's going to be with you till the day you die. You can't get that out of you, right? So you're emotionally vested. You're tr- to an average person, it's like, what are you guys complaining about? It's just, we're out. It's done. It's over. Why are you still complaining about it? What are you talking about? You weren't there seeing what uh, sacrifice we were paying. Was there was there hardcore arguments on the back end, disagreements, fights, saying, what the hell are we doing? Who's agreeing to this? Was there anybody courageous enough to go to McKinsey and say, why are you making this decision? Why are we going? Were there any stories like that that we're not aware of? No, not that I know of. Uh, How is that even possible, I, that's though? That's exactly right. I mean, that's why I made the video, because I felt exactly what we're talking about now. No one's having these conversations, and it's crazy. It really, it was just quite, I, I couldn't fathom the, the list of decisions that were made. And, you know, I've had some staff officers that wrote some of the operational plans and and they told me that Bagram was always part of the plans, but the National Security Council rejected it. Right. And so, you know, they're not all dumb people, but it's just the way these decisions were made without pushback was really my whole contention from that first video. So, OK, so we, we've had multiple people that have talked about how different we could have done it. You gave one of them. We could have waited a little bit because the season would have been better if we would have gone October to March instead of, you know, because they're trained for that, uh, you know, but they wanted to do a PR stunt because of 9-11, so they didn't want to wait that long. They wanted to get it done. What other things could we have done differently? Well, the the no-brainer is we should have just held on to Bagram and maintained air support within the country, I mean, for, for decades. That would have been so easy to do. That's what we still do in Korea. Though. I mean, we got hundreds of thousands still across Europe from World War II. I mean, th- that was the no-brainer. You, with a 1,000 people, you could have held Bagram and you could have had this huge air presence. And that's what we've been doing for the last five years. I mean, people don't really, like, it's not like the wars of 2009 through 12. I mean, really, for the last five years, all we've done is provide air support uh, for our Afghan national partners. And so the decision to pull that, I mean, I just, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around it. Stu, most of us saw this clip. Yeah. This clip went viral, you know, to, and then you hear people saying, well, you know, it's not really this. It's Photoshop. It's, this, it's from another time. It's this. It's that. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Why are you guys spreading conspiracy theories? What, what can you tell us from personal experience of what this, this image, this picture, this video that we all saw represents? Yeah, I mean, that's real. Um, <laughs> some of those pilots. So imagine a 03, uh, a mid-20s, Air Force pilot in that plane right now, and he has to make decisions of whether he's going to kill oh, three. Yeah, young guys, right? <sighs> so, like, that's not talked about. Think about the 20 year old pilot that has to make decisions to either stop the plane or keep driving and kill Dang. potentially all those people holding on to the plane. 
And they were afraid that if they stopped the plane, the plane was going to get overrun and destroyed. And so that poor guy had to make the decision to essentially kill people to take off. Mm -hmm. And who were those people? What were they looking to do? So this is the um, H. Kaya airfield. So this is we made the decision to, to basically drop down to two two spots, the embassy and H. Kaya airfield. And then eventually we evacuated the embassy. And now we're just operating out of this place. This place was just not easily defended. It had like 13, 14 checkpoints. And what happened was on 15 August, when the Taliban rolled up, they pushed all of the civilians into the airfield and kind of used them as cover when they were getting into firefights. And so when they pushed all the civilians on the airfield, this is right when the Americans were also responding, didn't have their act together. This was the chaos that ensued. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.